Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. Today we begin a new module which is Conservation Laws Part 1. This module will have three lectures and we look at the Indian Forest Act and the Forest Conservation Act in great detail. So the first two lectures will deal with the Indian Forest Act of 1927 and the third lecture will deal with the Forest Conservation Act of 1980. So let's begin with the Indian Forest Act. The preamble says the Indian Forest Act 1927 enacted on 21st of September 1927. So, 1927 as uh, you will recall is a time when India was being governed by the Britishers. So, this is essentially a British act, an act to consolidate the law relating to forests, the transit of forest produce and the duty levyable on timber and other forest produce. <coughs> so, what is the objective? This is an act to consolidate the law relating to forests. So, it is trying to add together all the different laws that are relating to forests and the transit of forest produce and the duty levyable on timber and other forest produce. Then it goes on, whereas it is expedient to consolidate the law relating to forests, the transit of forest produce and the duty levyable on timber and other forest produce, it is hereby enacted as follows. So, in this case, the important thing to note is, this act is not talking about conservation, it is not talking about environmental security, ecological security, it is not talking about preservation of anything, it is just talking about uh, things from a uh, business point of view. So, how are you going to regulate the extraction of timber, the movement of timber, how are you going to levy duties on timber and on other forest produce? So, this is basically a mercantile act and this act was made so that all of these different things could be consolidated and the maximum extraction could be done by the Britishers. Now, in this context, the ruling of the Honorable Supreme Court of India in Messrs. Burakar Coal Company and others becomes relevant. While holding that, it is permissible to look at the preamble for understanding the import of the various clauses contained in the bill. This court has not said that full effect should not be given to the express provisions of the bill, even though they appear to go beyond the terms of the preamble. It is one of the cardinal principles of construction that where the language of an act is clear, the preamble must be disregarded. Though where the object or meaning of an enactment is not clear, the preamble may be resorted to explain it. That is, when we look at the preamble, then the preamble is only to be used to explain the different sections of the act. The preamble will not have an overriding effect over the sections of the act. So, with time what has happened is that the sections of the act have now been read with a point of view of conservation. So, when we talk about the extraction of forest produce, these days we look at the maximum amount of sustainable harvest that can be done, not the maximum amount of harvest. And this maximum amount of sustainable harvest is being done while taking care of the ecological and ecological security of the country and while ensuring that the local people or the forest dwellers, they have the maximum benefits. So, this is what the Supreme Court also is saying here. that. If you have a section that says something and even if it goes beyond the preamble or even if it does not conquer with the preamble, you will have to uh, read the section and give effect to the section. A preamble should only be used if there is an ambiguity in the section. The Honorable Court further moves, again where very general language is used in an enactment which it is clear must be intended to have a limited application, the preamble may be used to indicate to what particular instances the enactment is intended to apply. 
we cannot therefore start with the preamble for construing the provisions of an act though we would be justified in resorting to it. No, we will be required to do so if we find that the language used by parliament is ambiguous or is too general though in point of fact parliament intended that it should have a limited application. So, the sections are going to overrule the preamble. Similarly, in uh, Messrs. Motipur Zamindari Company Private Limited versus the State of PR, the Honorable Supreme Court said that the preamble cannot limit or change the meaning of the plain words of the Act. So, it should, it should not be taken to limit the words of the Act. In Rashtriya Mill Mazur Sangh versus the National Textile Corporation, the Honorable Court said that it is one of the cardinal principles of the statutory construction that where the language of an act is clear, the preamble cannot be invoked to curtail or restrict the scope of the enactment and only where the object or meaning of an enactment is not clear, the preamble may be resorted to explain it. So, with that, we now look at the arrangement of sections. So, the Indian Forest Act is divided into several chapters. The first chapter is preliminary and as with most of the acts, the first uh, section deals with the short title and extent and the second one is the definitions or the interpretation clause. Then we have a chapter on reserved forest, a chapter on village forest, a chapter on protected forest, a chapter on the control over forests and lands not being the property of government. So, it extends even to those forests and lands that are not government property. Of the duty on timber and other forest produce, of the control of timber and other forest produce in transit, of the collection of drift and stranded timber. So, even if you find a timber that is drifted or has stranded somewhere, so uh, this uh, act says that that timber will also be collected and disposed of in the manner provided. Then it talks about penalties and procedure. So, when we talk about penalties and procedure, it means that this is an act that has a certain part of substantive provisions and, and a certain part of procedural provisions. So, this is both a substantial as well as a procedural act. And for things that are not defined in the procedures in the act, we make use of the CRPC. Then we have a chapter on cattle trespass, forest officers, subsidiary rules and miscellaneous. So, section 1, short title, this act may be called the Indian Forest Act 1927. So, this is the name of the act. It extends to the whole of India except territories which immediately before the 1st of November 1956 were comprised in Part B states. Now, what is Part B states? It means Hyderabad, Jammu and Kashmir, Madhya Bharat, Mysore, Patiala, and East Punjab States Union, also known as PEPSU, Rajasthan, Saurashtra, and Travancore, Cochin. So, when this act was made, then it was not applicable to these areas. This was primarily applicable to the British areas, but then later on it was amended and it said that it will not be applicable to these territories. However, it applies to territories which immediately before the 1st of November 1956 were comprised in the states of Bihar, Bombay, Kurg, Delhi, Madhya Pradesh, Odisha, Punjab, Uttar Pradesh and West Bengal. But the government of any state may by notification in the official gazette bring this act into force in the whole or any specified part of the state to which this act extends and where it is not in force. So, in practice what has happened is that different state governments have notified that this act will be applicable to the territories of the state. And so, for all practical purposes, this act is applicable throughout India. Now, section 2, the interpretation clause says, in this act, unless there is anything repugnant in the subject or context, cattle includes elephants, camels, buffaloes, horses, mares, gildings, ponies, colts, fillies, mules, asses, pigs, rams, eaves, sheep, lambs, goats and kids. So, it includes cattle includes all of these, so cattle can also include other things apart from these. Forest officer means any person whom the state government or any officer empowered by the state government in this behalf may appoint to carry out all or any of the purposes of this act 
or to do anything required by this act or any rule made there under to be done by a forest officer. And in this case, this judgment becomes important. The Honorable Gauhati High Court in Abdul Aziz versus the Union Territory of Tripura. Now, here the court is saying that there can be no doubt that PW2, that is the plantation watcher, is a forest officer within the meaning of section 22 of the Indian Forest Act. So, even though this person is a watcher and he may be even a temporary employee, he may not be a permanent employee, but this person is included in the definition of forest officer. Why? Because forest officer is de defined therein as a person whom the state government or any officer empowered by the state government in this behalf may appoint to carry out all or any of the purposes of the Forest Act or to do anything required by the Act or any rule made thereunder to be done by a forest officer. Now, PW2, that is plantation watcher, is a menial come plantation watcher appointed by the divisional forest officer. So, he is empowered by the uh, by the uh, divisional forest officer who has been empowered to appoint forest officers. The very name plantation watcher shows that his duty was to watch the plantations. One of the purposes of the Indian Forest Act is to protect specified trees in the protected forest and if a plantation watcher sees a person catching down a pro uh, cutting down a protected tree from a plantation, he has to carry out the purpose of protecting such trees which means that a plantation watcher was a forest officer within the meaning of section 22 of the act. So, even though there might be a menial employee who is not a permanent employee and the designation does not say forest officer. For example, in a large number of cases, the designations themselves talk about officers. We have divisional forest officers, subdivisional forest officers, range forest officers, meat forest officers. So, in all of these designations, the word forest officer comes in the name. But even in those cases where the name does not spell out forest officer, those people are also included in the category of the forest officers under section 22 of the act. Further, it says forest offense means an offense punishable under this act or under any rule made thereunder. Forest produce includes the following whether found in or brought from a forest or not. So, basically it is categorizing forest produce into several categories. There are certain things that are forest produce whether they are found in a forest or they are brought from a forest or not. That is even if these things have not been collected from forest areas then too we will classify them as forest produce including things like timber. So, even if somebody has planted trees on his own agricultural field and has cut down those trees to extract timber, we will call timber as a forest produce. Charcoal, kotchuk, which is natural rubber that has not been vulcanized, katechu or katha, wood oil, resin, natural varnish, bark, lac, mahua flowers, mahua seeds, kut, myrobalums that is the, the dried uh, astringent fruit of the terminalia species used in uh, tanning and in inks and it also has medicinal properties. So, all of these whether they are found, found in a forest or they are brought from a forest or not they are forest produce. Then there are certain things that are forest produce only when they are found in a forest or brought from a forest not otherwise that is to say trees and leaves, flowers and fruits and all other parts of produce not here and before mentioned of trees. So, if we have flowers that have been collected except the mauva flowers. So, if you have other flowers then they will only be called forest produce if they are found in the forest or they have been brought from a forest not otherwise. Plants not being trees including grass, creeper, reed, moss and all parts or produce of such plants wild animals and skins, tusk, horn, bone, uh, silk, cocoon, honey and wax and all other parts of produce of animals, peat, surface soil, rocks and minerals including limestone, laterite, mineral oils and all products of mines or quarries. So, all of these things are forest produce only when they are found in a forest or they have been 
brought from a forest, not otherwise. Owner includes a coat of wards in respect of property under the superintendence or charge of such coat. River includes any stream, canal, creek or other channels, natural or artificial. Timber includes trees when they have fallen or have been felled and all wood whether cut up or fashioned or hollowed out for any purpose or not. So even if it has not been processed, then too we will call it timber. And tree includes palms, stumps, brushwood and canes. Now in this context, the Honorable Allahabad High Court in the state of UP versus District Judge Bijnor said that the definition is not exhaustive and instead it is, it is inclusive. Which means that apart from these things, because when you look at the definition, it says includes. So in this case, the Honorable High Court is saying that the definition is not exhaustive, it is inclusive definition. So other things can also be included. And so uh, the court said, ordinarily fish is a natural produce of pond, water channel, lake or river situated within the forest and so it has to be treated as a forest produce for the purpose of that. So fish, even though it is not included in the list, then too it is a forest produce. Then the Honorable Supreme Court of India said that where a product from bamboo is commercially different from it and in common parlance taken as a distinct product, the same would not be encompassed within the expression forest produce as defined in section 24 of the act, despite it being inclusive in nature. So if you have a bamboo product such as a bamboo mat, now bamboo mat is very commercially different and a common man would take it to be a very distinct product as against bamboo. So bamboo mat will not be included in the category of forest produce this because this is very different. And in view of all the above, we hold that bamboo mat is not a forest produce in the eye of that. So bamboo is a forest produce, but if you have converted it into a bamboo mat, then it is no longer a forest produce. Then the Honorable Supreme Court said, Latex is the modern name for kotuchuk. It is nothing but natural rubber. It means uh, not only milky substance obtained from the trees, but it included all milky substance processed till it is made marketable. Since the pressing does not result in bringing out a new commodity, but it preserves the same and renders it fit for being marketed, it does not change the character. So it was kotuchuk or latex when it was obtained for, from the trees, it continued to be so when it was treated by sulfuric acid and it continued to be so after it was dried with smoke to obtain the shape of sheets. And so even after this processing of treating with sulfuric acid and drying with smoke, it continues to be latex or kotuchuk and so it is a forest produce. So in this case, the Honorable Supreme Court is saying that in certain cases, where you are doing certain processing just to make things marketable and it is not changing the inherent nature of the uh, substance. So in that case, it will continue to be called a forest produce. So as against the example of bamboo versus bamboo mat, when you make a bamboo mat, it is very different from a bamboo. But when you make a dried uh, latex that has been treated with sulfuric acid, it continues to be latex and so it will still be called a forest produce. Then the Honorable Allahabad High Court said that even factory made katha, which is katechu, is a forest produce within the meaning of the definition of the word forest produce as defined under section 24 of the Indian Forest Act. Because when we saw in the definition of forest produce, it said the following whether found in or brought from a forest or not and here it includes katechu or katha. So even if you have katha that is factory made, then too it will be classified as forest produce under section 24 of the Indian Forest Act. In another ruling, the Honorable Madhya Pradesh High Court said that the drunk drop droppings from the cattle grazed in the forest area is not covered within the de definition of the forest produce. So even though it is an inclusive definition, but if somebody is grazing cattle inside the forest areas and these cattle have given out drunk drop droppings. So these dung droppings will not be classified as forest produce. 
Why? Because the grazing cattle are domestic animals which are not naturally found in the forest and as such the dung excreted by the cattle grazed in the forest area under license cannot form, form part of produce of animal found in or brought from the forest. Also it cannot be said that the dung droppings from the cattle grazed in the forest are under a license assumed the character of surface soil found or brought from a forest. In our opinion each of the two expressions all other parts of produce of animal and the surface soil found in or brought from the forest refers to natural occurrence in the forest. So in this case the drunk droppings are not forest produce. So you can see that um, even though the act defines a large number of things but we still have to resort to the court judgments for various other things because the courts may specify that certain things are included in the definition and certain things are not included in the definition. Then chapter 2 deals with reserve forests. Now reserve forests are those forests where all the rights are vested with the government. So the government has complete control and complete rights over these forests. And chapter 2 deals with what is a reserve forest and how to make a reserve forest. So in this case, Section 3 says power to reserve forests. The state government can constitute any forest land or wasteland which is the property of government or over which the government has proprietary rights or to the whole or any part of the forest produce of which the government is entitled a reserve forest in the manner here and after provided. So what can be made into a reserve forest? A forest land or a wasteland. And on these lands, the government should have proprietary rights either on the land or on the forest produce. And this can even be a partial right. But only in these cases can it be made into a reserve forest. So what happens when you want to make a reserve forest? Under section 4, there has to be a notification by the state government declaring that it has been decided to constitute such land as a reserve forest specifying the situation and limits and appointing a forest settlement officer. So there are three things that need to be done. First, you have to give out a notification declaring that this, this decision has been taken to constitute this land into a reserve forest. So it has to be notified in the official gazette. This notification should specify as nearly as possible the situation and limits of the land. Where is this land situated? And the government has to appoint a forest settlement officer to inquire into and determine the existence, nature and extent of any rights. Now, in this case, when we say specifying as nearly as possible, then we can describe the limits by roads, rivers, ridges or other well-known or readily intelligible boundaries. Then the officer appointed under clause C of subsection 1 shall ordinarily be a person not holding any forest office except that of forest settlement officer. Now, why is this clause important? Well, we have seen before in the case of principles of natural justice that one of the principles says nemo judex and causa sua. So, you cannot be a judge in your own case. So, if there is an officer who is holding a forest office and is acting as, an, as a forest settlement officer, so in that case, this person might be biased towards the forest department. And so, if you make somebody a forest settlement officer, you have to remove him from all the other forest offices. So, this is what it is saying. He shall ordinarily be a person not holding any forest office except that of the forest settlement officer. But here again, the important thing is ordinarily, which means that in certain cases, the uh, government can appoint a person holding a forest office also as a forest settlement officer if it deems it necessary. So, this is not a very strict provision. Nothing in this section shall prevent the state government from appointing any number of officers not exceeding three, not more than one of whom shall be a person holding any forest office except as aforesaid to perform the duties of a forest settlement officer under this act. So, the FSO does not have to be a single person, but the government can appoint up to three persons as the forest settlement officers. Now, once this notification is made, then there is a bar of accrual of forest rights. Because what is happening here is that the government wants to ascertain 
the rights of various people and the government wants to acquire these rights. So, for example, if there is a forest area and it has been decided that it should be made into a reserve forest and if I hold certain rights over that forest area. So, in, in that case, this section is saying that after this notification is made, no new rights will be created in this forest area, which means that I will not be able to sell this land to somebody else till this process is complete. And what will happen in this process is, I can go to the forest settlement officer and say that, sir, I have such and such rights in these lands. And when that happens and when the forest settlement officer inquires into it, the forest settlement officer can say that, yes, this person has these rights. So, what do we do with, the, with these rights now? So, the forest officer, uh, the forest settlement officer can say that, okay, why don't you sell us these rights? We are going to compensate you with such and such amount of money or we are going to give you such and such lands. And if the forest has to be made into a reserve forest, all the rights that are there, they have to be acquired by the government. And this is what this section is referring to. So, there is a bar of accrual of forest rights on these lands followed by a proclamation by the forest settlement officer, which means that not just the notification, but then the forest settlement officer shall publish in the local language in every town and village in the neighborhood of the land, a proclamation that specifies all of these things, the situation and limits of the forest, the consequences of what will happen when this forest becomes reserved and fixing a period of not less than three months from the date of such proclamation and requiring every person claiming right uh, mentioned in section 4 or 5 within such period either to present to the FSO a written notice specifying or to appear before him and state the nature of such right and the amount of and particulars of compensation if any claimed in respect thereof which means that people are given this opportunity to be heard. They are given a time period of three months and in this time period, they have to uh, give a notice to the forest settlement officer that these are my rights and this is the compensation that I will be willing to take if you want to take up these rights. Then the forest set settlement officer inquires about these things. So, he checks whether or not these are correct or not and for this inquiry, he has certain powers power to enter by himself or any officer authorized by him for the purpose upon any land and to survey, demarcate and make a map of the same and the powers of a civil court in the trial of suits. What are the powers of a civil court? The civil court can ask for documents, it can ask for witnesses to come, give statements and it can record those statements to be used as evidence. So, that is the power of the civil court and the forest settlement officer has these powers. So, he can enter into any land, he can make maps, he can uh, uh, survey areas or he can do all of these powers that are vested with the civil courts. Then extinction of rights, if somebody does not uh, 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 provide any claim, then those rights will be, ex will be extinguished. Then treatment of claims relating to practice of shifting cultivation. So, uh, the FSO shall record a statement setting forth the particulars of the claim and of any local rule or order under which the practice is allowed or regulated. And then the state government can make an order permitting or prohibiting the practice fully or in part. That is in areas where there is shifting cultivation, the state government can permit or prohibit this activity. In case it is permitted, then the FSO may arrange for its exercise by altering the limits of land under settlement so as to exclude land of sufficient extent of a suitable kind and in a locality reasonably convenient for the purpose of the claimants or by causing certain portions of the land under settlement to be separately demarcated and giving permission to the claimants to practice shifting cultivation therein under such conditions as he may prescribe. So, if there are uh, claims of shifting cultivation and if they are permitted, then either a piece of land can be, uh, uh, can be identified and these uh, people who are, are doing shifting cultivation, they can be allowed their rights of shifting cultivation on those pieces of land that are very nearby or even in the case of the area that is to be made a reserve forest, 
uh, these people can be given these rights of shifting cultivation on those areas. So, these are special privileges. Then we have power to acquire land over which a right is claimed. So, what happens in the case of a claim? Then the forest settlement officer can either exclude the land from the limits of the proposed forest. So, the forest uh, settlement officer can say that okay, uh, people have rights on these pieces of land. So, let us not make it into a reserve forest or the FSO can come to an agreement with the owner thereof for the surrender of his rights or can proceed to acquire such land in the manner provided by the Land Acquisition Act 1894. And then the provisions of the Land Acquisition Act also become applicable. Order on claims to right of pasture or to forest produce. In case of a claim to rights of pasture or to forest produce, the FSO shall pass an order admitting or rejecting the same in whole or in part. Then record to be made by the FSO. So, the FSO when passing any order under section 12 shall record two things. One is particulars of the person who has the rights, the name of the person, father's name, caste, residence, occupation. So, these will be used to identify the person accurately. So, that is the particulars of the person and the particulars of the property. The designation, position and area of all fields or group of fields and the designation and position of all buildings in respect of which the exercise of such rights is claimed. So, all the rights have to be noted down very diligently, very meticulously. Then record where he admits claim. If the FSO admits in whole or in part any claim under section 12, he shall also record the extent to which the claim is so admitted, specifying the number and description of the cattle which the claimant is from time to time entitled to graze in the forest, the season during which such pasture is permitted, the quantity of timber and other forest produce which, is, which he is from time to time authorized to receive or take and such other particulars as the case may require. He shall also record whether the timber or other forest produce obtained by the exercise of the rights claimed may be sold or bartered. So, all the rights have to be written down. Exercise of rights admitted. After making such record, the FSO shall to the best of his ability and having due regard to the maintenance of the reserve forest in respect of which the claim is made, pass such orders as will ensure the continued exercise of rights so admitted. And for this purpose, he can alter the limits or he can give certain other forest areas or he can uh, uh, record an order uh, continuing to such claimants the right of pasture or forest produce and giving all the descriptions. Then there is the option of commutation of rights. In case the forest settlement officer finds it impossible having due regard to the maintenance of the reserve forest to make such settlement under section 15 as shall ensure the continued exercise of the said rights to the extent so admitted, he shall subject to such rules as the state government may make in this behalf, commute such rights by the payment to such persons a sum of money in lieu thereof or by the grant of land or in such other manner as he thinks fit. So, another option with the FSO is that he may commute the rights of these people by giving them a certain amount of compensation and this compensation may be in the form of money or it can be in the form of land or it can be in certain other ways. So, in this case there is a bargaining going on and the forest settlement officer is acquiring the rights by giving certain compensation to the people. Then appeal from orders passed under section 11, 12, 15 or 16. So, any person who has made a claim under this act or any forest officer or other person generally or specially empowered by the state government in this behalf may within three months from the date of the order passed on such claim by the FSO under section 11, 12, 15 or 16 present an appeal from such order to such or officer of the revenue department of rank not lower than that of a collector as the state government may by notification in the official gazette appoint to hear appeals from such orders. That is the order of the forest settlement officer is not the final order. If somebody is feeling aggrieved, then he or she may approach the appellate authority. And here the appellate authority belongs to the revenue department. So, in this case, 
all sorts of biases get removed because the first officer is working for the forest department but the second officer has to belong to the revenue department and should be of a rank not below that of the collector. So this is the process of appeal. Then appeal under section 17, every appeal under uh, section 17 shall be made by petition in writing and may be delivered to the FSO who shall forward it without, without delay to the authority competent to hear the same. So the person can give the appeal also to the FSO and the FSO will then send it to the appellate authority. Now in this case, there can also be a forest court established by the state government. So the uh, government can also say that in place of the revenue officer, let us make a separate court itself. Then it allows for leaders and then finally in under section 20, we get the notification declaring the forest reserved. So how does a forest get reserved? It gets reserved with a notification and only after all of these things ha have happened. One, the period fixed under uh, six, section 6 for preferring claims has elapsed and all claims if any made under that section or section 9 have been disposed of by the FSO. So this period that was given for preferring claims, it should have elapsed and the claims should have been disposed of. If any such claims have been made, the period limited by section 17 for appealing from the orders passed on such claims has elapsed and all appeals, if any, presented within such period have been disposed of by the appellate officer or the court. So not only should the claims period be over and the claims disposed of, but also the appeal period should be over and the appeals also disposed of. All lands, if any, to be included in the proposed forest, which the FSO has under section 11 elected to acquire under the Land Acquisition Act have become vested in the government under section 16 of that act. So for those areas that have to be acquired under the Land Acquisition Act, the acquisition should be complete. When all of these have been done, then the state government shall publish a notification in the official gazette, specifying definitely according to boundary marks erected or otherwise, the limits of the forest which is to be reserved and declaring the same to be reserved from a date fixed by the notification. And from the date so fixed, such forest shall be deemed to be a reserved forest. So the process is a bit lengthy, it's a bit cumbersome, but it has been made so, so to ensure that the rights of any person are not negatively impacted. So people are given time to say that they have rights. If they have rights, then either that area will be removed from the notification or those rights will be acquired by giving certain amount of compensation or that land will be acquired as per the Land Acquisition Act. And even after this is done, there is a period of appeals, there is an appellate authority. And when all of these things have happened, when all the appeals have also been dealt with, all the acquisitions have been made, only then the government will issue the notification specifying the area and saying that this becomes a reserve forest from the state. So after this point, all the rights are vested with the state government unless otherwise stated as in the case of certain rights of pasture or forest produce that the state government may permit to the uh, people living nearby. Then section 21 says publication of translation of such notification in the neighborhood of the forest. So the forest officer shall before the date fixed by such notification cause a translation thereof into the local vernacular to be published in every town and village in the neighborhood of the forest. So this again has to be in the local language. Power to revise arrangement made under section 15 or section 18. So the state government has power to revise these arrangements within five years from the publication of notification. No right acquired over reserve forest except as here provided. So no rights will be acquired over these reserve forests except provided under this act except by succession or under a grant or contract in writing made by or on behalf of the government or some person in whom such right was vested when the notification under section 20 was issued. So it is saying that no new rights will be created here. Rights not to be alienated without sanction. So if certain rights have been given to the people, they will not be removed without sanction. 
is what this particular section is saying. Power to stop waste and water courses in reserve forests. So once the government has declared that it is now government property, it is now a reserve forest, then the forest officer may with the previous sanction of the state government or of any officer duly authorized by it in this behalf, stop any public or private way or water course in a reserve forest, provided that a substitute for the way or water course so stopped, which the state government deems to be reasonably convenient, already exists or has been provided or constructed by the forest officer in lieu thereof. Meaning that once the government has declared a piece of forest as a reserve forest, then the government may stop people from entering or may change the water courses. But the government can only do so when a reasonable alternative exists or has been created. Otherwise, the rights of the people should not be harmed, is what this section is saying. Now, in this context, the Honorable Madhya Pradesh High Court in Anand Transport Company Private Limited versus DFO said that forest roads are not public highways. No person has an unrestricted right to the use of forest roads. The state government and conservative have the power to impose restrictions. Considering the cost of maintenance incurred by the forest department, it has the power to levy a fee on the user of the road to meet the costs of maintenance and a fee is in the nature of a charge for the service rendered. So the forest roads are not public highways. The, uh, the movement on that can be regulated and a fee can also be charged. As the forest roads are the property of the forest department of the state normally meant for persons connected with the working of the department, they do not stand in the same position as public highways. The department has the right to regulate use of the roads by persons or for purposes not connected with the working of the department. We are of the opinion that the imposition of a reasonable fee for such user is neither illegal nor in contravention of Article 265 of the Constitution of India. Now, once in, uh, an area has been declared a reserve forest, certain restrictions come in. So, acts prohibited in such forest, making a fresh clearing, setting fire, kindling any fire, leaving a fire burning so as to endanger a forest or in a reserve forest, kindling or keeping or canning uh, fire except in such seasons as the forest officer may notify in this behalf, trespassing or pasturing cattle, permitting cattle to, to trespass, all of these become offences. Now here are the substantive provisions of the act. So it is defining offences and later on it also prescribes punishment for them. So all these things are prohibited, causing damage by negligence in felling any tree, cutting or dragging any timber, felling, girdling, lopping, tapping, burning tree, stripping off bark and leaves, damaging the trees, quarrying stone, burning lime or, char or charcoal, clearing up or breaking any land for cultivation and so on. So all of these become prohibited activities. Then in this context, the Honorable Odisha High Court said that in the absence of any evidence that these logs were government property, I fail to understand how the conviction of the petitioner can stand for illegal removal of forest produce from a reserved area. The rules at best raise a presumption that in absence of evidence, it shall be presumed that they are government property, but this is only a rule of evidence and the accused cannot be convicted on a mere presumption. So here the Honorable High Court is saying that if somebody has been uh, charged with removal of forest produce such as timber, then the department has to establish that these trees were removed from the forest areas. Then in section 27, power to declare forest no longer reserved, the state government may by notification in the official gazette direct that from a date fixed by such notification, any forest or any portion thereof reserved under this act shall cease to be a reserved forest. So the forest can also be de-reserved. However, the rights that have been extinguished therein shall not revive in consequence of such cessation. So section 27 says that there is a power of the state government to declare forest no longer reserved. However, it was then changed by section 21 of the uh, Forest Conservation Act, which says that notwithstanding anything contained in any other law for the time being in force in a state, 
नो स्टेट गवर्नमेंट और अथॉरिटी शैल मेक एक्सेप्ट विद द प्रायर अप्रूवल ऑफ द सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट एनी ऑर्डर डायरेक्टिंग दैट एनी रिजर्व फॉरेस्ट और एनी पोर्शन देयर ऑफ शैल सीज टू बी रिजर्व मीनिंग दैट नो द स्टेट गवर्नमेंट के नॉट टेक अ यूनिटरल एक्शन इट हैज टू बी विद द परमिशन ऑफ द सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट देन चैप्टर थ्री डील्स विथ विलेज फॉरेस्ट द स्टेट गवर्नमेंट में असाइन टू एनी विलेज कम्युनिटी द राइट्स ऑफ गवर्नमेंट टू और ओवर एनी लैंड विच हैज बिन कॉन्स्टिट्यूटेड अ रिजर्व फॉरेस्ट एंड मे कैंसिल सच असाइनमेंट एंड ऑल फॉरेस्ट सो असाइंड शैल बी कॉल्ड विलेज फॉरेस्ट सो इन दिस केस द स्टेट गवर्नमेंट कैन असाइन टू अ विलेज कम्युनिटी द राइट्स ऑफ गवर्नमेंट ओवर एनी लैंड दैट हैज बिन कॉन्स्टिट्यूटेड एज अ रिजर्व फॉरेस्ट एंड दे बिकम विलेज फॉरेस्ट नेक्स्ट वी हैव प्रोटेक्टेड फॉरेस्ट so protected forest says that the state government may by notification in the official gazette declare the provisions of this chapter applicable to any forest land or waste land which is not included in a reserve forest but which is the property of the government or over which the government has proprietary rights or to the whole or any part of the forest produce of which the government is entitled so it says that what can be made into a protected forest it can only be a forest land or a wasteland which is not included in the reserve forest so the government cannot declare a reserve forest as a protected forest but any other forest land or wasteland which is either the property of the government or the government has proprietary rights over the forest produce can be made into protected forest and no such notification shall be made unless the nature and extent of rights of government or of private persons in or over the forest land or wasteland comprised therein have been inquired into and recorded at a survey or settlement or in such other manner as the state government thinks sufficient every such record shall be presumed to be correct until the contrary is proved so basically what is the difference between a reserve forest and a protected forest in this case the procedures are not that elaborate in the case of reserve forest the, the procedures were extremely elaborate how much time has to be given how much time has to be given for the appeal who will be the appellate authority and so on but in this case the processes are very simple so in this case how is the settling of rights done there is no need for an elaborate inquiry there is assumption of being correct until proven wrong and the declaration does does not need to wait till the rights get settled so these are the protected forests now in the protected forests the state government has the power to declare any trees or class of trees in the protected forest to be reserved from a date fixed by the notification that is even in the protected forest you can uh, delineate that these species of trees are reserved for the government purpose publication of translation of such a notification in the neighborhood here again the notifications have to be translated into the local language and they have to be affix in a conspicuous place in every town and village in the neighborhood so that people know that this notification has come up power to make rules for the protected forest the state government may make rules to regulate several matters cutting sawing conversion and removal of trees and timber granting of licenses uh to take trees timber forest produce remove things payments etc so all different things can be regulated by the state government now in this context the honorable patna high court uh, specified that the expression breaking up or clearing for cultivation occurring in section 331c can only mean that what has been prohibited is reclaiming any portion of a protected forest for the purpose of cultivation by breaking up the soils for the first time after the publication of the notification and it does not extend to the prohibition of cultivation of such land which has already been broken up or cleared and brought into cultivation from before the uh, the issue of the notification so this is what the court is referring to here when we look at section 33 penalties for acts in contravention of notification under section 30 or rules made under section 32 so it it lists out all different uh, offenses and here it says contrary to the prohibition under section 30 breaks up or clears for cultivation or any other purpose any land in any protected forest so the court here is saying that only the first breaking up is included here not the subsequent ones now all of these 
are punishable with imprisonment for a term which may extend to 6 months or with fine which may extend to uh, 500 rupees or with both. So, in this case we have seen that the act has defined the offenses and has prescribed the uh, punishments for those. So, in this aspect we can see that there are several substantive provisions. Then section 34 says nothing in this chapter to prohibit acts done in certain cases. So, anything can be done with the prior permission in writing of the forest officer. So, it, if something is done with permission then that is not prohibited. So, in this context what are the differences between the reserve forest and protected forest? So, the reserve forest cannot become protected forest but protected forest can become reserve forest because we looked at the making of reserve forest. So, any forest land over which government has rights. A PF is a forest land over which government has rights. So, it can become an RF. But in the construction of PF, it said that any forest land or wasteland that is not a reserve forest, only that can be notified as a PF. Notification after full settlement of rights in case of RF, but notification possible pending settlement of rights in PF. So, PF uh, the, pro uh, the procedure is fast and it is not very exhaustive. There is a forest settlement officer in the case of RF but not in the case of PF. No new rights can accrue in case of RF but rights alleged to exist at the time of notification of PF will be allowed to continue under section 29.3. Restriction on alienation of rights in RF under section 24 but no such restriction in the case of PF. Products can't be sold or bartered in the case of RF, but no such restriction under PF. Every act prohibited unless permitted for RF and every act permitted unless prohibited for PF. Boundary is well demarcated for RF, but not for PF. Trespass is an offense for RF, but not for PF. And compensation as punishment for damage in case of RF, but not in the case of PF. So, these are the basic differences between reserve forest and protected forest. Then chapter 5 deals with control over forests and lands not being the property of government. So, the government can also exert control over forests and lands that are not its property under these sections. So, protection of forests for special purposes. So, the government can regulate or prohibit in any forest or wasteland the breaking up or clearing of land for cultivation, pasturing of cattle, firing or clearing of, ve of vegetation for purposes such as protection against a storm, wind, rolling stones, floods, avalanches, preservation of soil on the ridges and slopes, maintenance of water supply, protection of roads, bridges, railways and other lines of communication, preservation of public health. And the state government may for such purpose construct at its own expense in or upon any forest or wasteland such work as it thinks fit. Then no notification shall be made under subsection 1 nor shall any work be begun under subsection 2 until after the issue of a notice to the owner of such forest or land calling on him to show cause and other things. So, basically this is uh, talking about natural justice that the person who has uh, the proprietary rights over those land that person has to be given notice and given a, uh, an opportunity to explain why this thing should not be done. Then the government can assume management of forest in case of neglect of or willful disobedience to any regulation or prohibition under section 35 or if the purposes of any work to be constructed under that section so require the state government may after notice in writing to the owner of such forest or land and after considering his objections if any place the same under control of a forest officer and may declare that all or any provisions of this act relating to reserve forest shall apply to such forest or land. And the net profits if any arising from the management of such forest or land shall be paid to the said owner. So, the government can assume the management of these private forests and may uh, and uh, the, the net profits out of the workings of those forests will be given to the owner. Then there is uh, an option of expropriation of forests in cases, protection of forests at the request of owners. So, we also get uh, these requests from time to time in which case 
uh, the owners themselves approach the government and say that please manage these lands for us. Then chapter 6 talks about duty on timber and other forest produce. So what are the duties to be levied? So in this context when we looked at the preamble one of the objectives of this act was to make uh, regulations regarding the imposition of duties and this is the chapter that is dealing with that. So the government has the power to impose duty on timber or other forest produce as mentioned here. Limit not to apply to purchase money or royalty, so it is unlimited. Then chapter 7 talks about the control of timber and other forest produce in transit. So this again was one of the objectives of the act. So the government has the power to make rules to regulate the transit of forest produce. So if there is a forest produce as defined in the act and if this forest produce is being moved from one place to another, then the government has the power to make rules to regulate this. And in particular, the government may uh, prescribe the routes through which the timber may be imported, exported, moved and so on. Uh, it can issue passes for regulating the movement and so on. Then section 41A talks about powers of the central government as to the movement of timber across custom frontiers. Now what is happening here is when we look at 41A, it means that it was added later on between 41 and 42. So the section 41 talks only about the powers of the state government. So section 41A was uh, incorporated later on to give powers to the central government as to the movement of timber across customs frontiers. So into and outside of the country. Penalty for breach of rules. So here again are the substantive provisions. Government and forest officers not liable for damage to forest produce at the depot unless and until it uh, such loss or damage was made negligently, maliciously or fraudulently. If not, then the officers are not responsible. All persons bound to aid in case of accidents at depot. Then chapter 8 deals with collection of drift and stranded timber. So if there is a, some timber that is drifting mostly in the waterways, so if it is floating around, then that timber can be collected. If there is a timber that is found stranded somewhere, then that timber will also be collected. So section 45 says certain kinds of timber to be deemed property of government until title thereto proved and may be collected accordingly. So if these timber are found stranded or drifting, then they will be deemed to be the government property until title is proved by some other person who is able to prove that these are my timber. And these timbers can be collected. Uh, notice is given to the claimants of uh, timber. There is a procedure where in the person can prove that it is his timber. If uh, the timber, if uh, this drift or stranded timber is unclaimed, then there are provisions to dispose it of in uh, this manner. Government and its officers are not liable for damage to such timber. Payment to be made by the claimant before timber is delivered to him and power to make rules and prescribe the penalties. So the state government in, uh, can make rules to regulate the salving, collection, disposal of all timber, use and registration of boards, amounts to be paid, use and, res and registration of hammers and so on. So basically what we have seen that is uh, that uh, the Indian Forest Act is dealing with a large number of mercantile aspects. So who will have uh, rights over these properties, how will these rights be ascertained, how will these timber be disposed of and so on. So we will continue this, this discussion in the uh, next lecture. That is all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.